Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we talk about all things Beatles, their past, the present. And I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of this show, also known for my syndicated Beatles program called Every Little Thing. Being joined by my three co-hosts. First of all, we've got Steve Marinucci, who writes for Beatles Examiner. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. And also, we've got Alan Cozen from Beatle Fan Magazine. Hi, Alan. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. And also from Beatle Fan, Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everyone. And once again, we brought back an, our special guest, Tom Franjone, who also writes for Beatle Fan, does a lot of work for Mark Lapidos, helping him out with the Fest for Beatle Fans, and also helps out Joe Johnson's Beatle Brunch. Hello, Tom. Hello, Ken. I told you, it's like, you know, like a puppy. You know, you feed me once, and that's it. I'm just going to keep coming back. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to see We're going to see if we can finish <laughs> the year in review now. Yeah. So we'll probably leave one thing left, and then Tom will want to join us again. So. Uh, there you go. Just keep enough to keep me coming back. Leave them wanting more, right? That's right. Yeah. That's a very important element mm. in this business. You know, got to tease people. Leave them yes. wanting one more thing. Yes. So uh, we have uh, one Beatle left to cover for 2014, and that being Paul McCartney. And there are a lot of things that happened in the past year. Uh, of course, there were a lot of releases that came out, but I thought we'd start by talking about his Out There tour. And I know that I had the chance to see him twice in the past year because I went to his show in Albany, which was his first show in the U.S. And also Steve and I, we met for the first time at uh, Candlestick Park mm. to see Paul there. So, uh, you know, I thought it was a tremendous concert, but then I've been, you know, praising Paul's concerts time and time again. I'm always amazed at how much he puts into it, how at his age he can do what he does for, for two and a half to three hours. And, uh, you know, it's just amazing to me that he's still doing this and he's doing it, you know, in part, let's face it, because he still loves doing it. And the thrill for me is always from tour to tour, whatever changes he makes in the set list. But, uh, you know, it's also a thrill for me on so many levels because I also enjoy, and I can also apply this to seeing Ringo or, or other veterans, seeing other people who are younger in the audience and how they're responding to it and getting into it. You know, it's kind of like a religious experience in a lot of ways. And when you see a lot of different generations embracing Paul's music as well as Ringo's, you know, that's such a powerful thing to me. And also, you know, seeing the, the show at Candlestick Park with Steve was such a great experience, mm. meeting him for the first time and seeing it in, in such a historic venue and the last concert there. But uh, I would say it was a, a great tour, and uh, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a better tour than his recent tours because they're all very similar. But uh, I want to get each of your takes on the Out There Tour, and uh, I need to know, I don't, I'm not sure, Alan, if you got to see Paul, and uh, also Al. I'm sure, Tom, you did. No, actually, this was the first year, in because Paul's been pretty much constantly on the road the last, whatever, five to six years, and always something comes up in New York. I mean, we, we get spoiled that way. Uh, right. As close as he got to here was Albany. I think that was uh, the 4th of July weekend. Mm -hmm. And um, we weren't able to get up there uh, for that holiday weekend. So this was the first year in, in quite a while that, um, I mean, he, he passed through New York, I think, did a couple of talk shows or something, um, but nothing nothing uh, specific in in our area, no full shows. So, uh, no, I, di I did not get to see him. I, you know, I followed along, uh, you know, through all uh, the websites and obviously Steve's updates and you know, that Candlestick Park show, obviously, uh, you know, that that's one for, you know, one kind of in the real special department, uh, given its history. And again, always, always nice to get a, you know, a nice nod to something like when he did uh, the, the the city field out here where Shea Stadium once stood and, you know, hauled out I'm um, Down. Mm -hmm. You know, the mm -hmm. Beatles had done there many years ago and obviously closing uh, his show this year or, or, you know, in the last set anyway, doing the song that closed the Beatles official, you know, last concert long tall sally that's you know that had to be a moment i mean but i'll, I'll defer to you guys on that one. Oh yeah but i, I kind of predicted that was going to happen sure sure 
I think Paul is kind of predictable, unfortunately. But uh, I, I thought that he was going to do that. And I also thought he was going to do San Francisco Bay Blues, which mm. he did. Mm. So, you know, that's kind of what Paul does. If he's in Kansas City, guess what song he's going to play? Yeah. yeah. You know, it's like, in other words, it's like, like Ken, when he plays at Madison Square Garden, he's always going to do rock show. Oh, no, he doesn't. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> <You know. laughs> but uh, he, he should do rock show. Every yeah, time. you think. <laughs> um, uh, he's, uh, you know, he, he, he gets in his, in his ways. I think, you know, what's, what's kind of interesting, and again, observing the tour from afar, was what got built into the set list from the most recent studio album, from New. Uh, at mm. the end, I guess it's actually end of 13, when that kicked off, I guess, overseas. But then when it came here, it was uh, pretty much a four-song uh, sampling from New, which... Yeah, the single for sure, and the, the title track of the album that 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 seemed like a natural. What what did you guys think about the others? Because those seem to be the ones he did when he did the mini shows, like at Times Square and mm -hmm. um, yeah, any of the TV stuff. What did you guys think of the selection of those those sets, those songs built into the set list? I I thought New was a natural because it was a bouncy song. Sure. I thought that was a, that was a, a great song. The other ones, I mean, you know, I mean he. I was listening to the album again the other night, and um, I mean, he—I think he picked probably, he probably picked the best ones. I mean, there there are good ones, bad ones. I don't know, but uh, I mean, yeah, I'm I'm glad he picked what he did. Uh, they were they worked in that in that situation. I think it, what more interesting is how he plays with the set list or doesn't play with the set list, you know. Um, and people keep hoping that he'll you know, do a turnover on the, on the set list and he does not, you know, it's, um, I guess to keep things, you know, somewhat sane on, on, on the band's end too, you know, but, uh, it, well, uh, you know, you know, I, I keep hearing this over and over uh, from people and I think what they've, you know, maybe they've just been spoiled by the fact that a Bruce Springsteen will change at the drop of a hat will suddenly come up with as they, as they call them audibles. Mm. And, right. but Bruce is one of the very few artists who does that. Mm. Most bands just, you know, they have like, for instance, I'm sure uh, that these monthly shows, the Billy Joel is yeah. doing at Madison square garden uh, or Tom just recently saw Elton John in Brooklyn at, uh, uh, at the, Bar uh, the Barclay center. And I'm pretty sure that they, do a very structured set. Actually, mm -hmm. Al, the Billy Joel ones, that's one of the things with his um, residency at the Garden. There, There is definitely an opening set and an ending set. You know, it's it's loaded with hits, but right. the, the middle actually part of the platform for that residency is him to do songs, as he says, they're kind of new to me because I never played them live. So oh, okay. the middle is kind of peppered with a few, and they're different each month. But again, you know, the, the Paul thing, Al, much to your point, I mean, you know that this that could be a separate show all to itself. You know, uh, we yeah. we had this uh, a very enlightening panel uh, at at the at the fest I think in Chicago when we uh -huh. uh, did the poll of you know we we were very clear to say we're not going to call this what should Paul do. The answer there is Paul should do whatever he wants to do. Right. Um, it was what song would you like to hear him do? Okay, it's quite a, quite a different matter. But um, I remember uh, Al. You know, we were there. The was it the opening night? I guess at uh -huh. City Field a couple of yes. years back and. You know, we were talking with some of our our Beatle brethren out here, and it was like, oh my God, you can probably do the Long Winding Road again, and that was probably the best song he did all night. He, he exactly. I remember looking at you and saying, you know why he does yep. that every night? Because uh -huh. it sounds like that. That's exactly. why he does it every night. Yep. But um, the, you know, the, the I had done a piece for Beatle fan, I think, in the past year, so uh -huh. we can bring this back to the 2014 agenda, that basically looked at Paul's return to the road for 25 years, and yeah. Yesterday and let it be have been in air, you know, every tour or let me roll it or whatever it is. But I did, you know, I put my accountant hat on for a minute and said, you know, from this tour to this tour, thirty percent of the show changed. Now thirty percent mm -hmm. of a show for him, you know, is you know, a dozen songs or so. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot. Um <laughs> because, you know, with a catalog so you know, that that's so vaunted, you know. Uh, you know, we, we've told this tale, you know, out of school many times. I mean, at Yankee Stadium in 11, there were four people there that shared my last name who had never seen Paul before. Right. Never yes. seen mm -hmm. him. And if they left, 
Yankee Stadium. He didn't even play Let It Be and Hey Jude and Long Winding Road. They feel ripped off. Yeah. I would too, you know. I mean, and right. frankly, you know, for in the good years, seeing him once a year or, you know, in the, the lean years, you know, waiting, you know, five years or more to see him, I'm okay spending four minutes listening to him do the Long Winding Road. I'm, I'm good. I'm fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In fact, he even said in an interview uh, in the fall, uh, he was asked if there were like any songs that he would, you know, maybe uh, maybe wouldn't mind, uh, you know, not having to do for a while. And I think he said, let it be and and hey, Jude, if I recall correctly. Yeah. Well, what was and, nice is, you know, the um, when he gets an opportunity to do something a little bit left of center, like, um I guess uh, it was now two years ago, the, the hurricane benefit out here, the Sandy yes. Benefit, 12, 12. Mm-hmm. You know, Paul's going to you know close the show, and he's going to get a, whatever he got, a six-song set or something like that. Mm-hmm. And pretty much we were sitting there going, okay, it'll be Let It Be, Hey Jude. Right. And, right. and he did uh-huh. none of them. None of them. Yeah. Um, which was kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he did did ones that are right out of the set out of the core set list, Blackbird and Live and Let Die and mm-hmm. uh, 1985. But it was it was great not to, you know, not to get into autopilot mode. It really was really exactly. Hmm. Well, I was gonna I was gonna say I still keep dreaming for Mullet Tire. I want to see that before I die. So, you go, to, go to Canada then. Go to Canada. Uh, yeah. I know. It does, I know. Every time he plays in Canada, he does it. <laughs> Yeah, well, I keep wishing he'd do it here. Yeah. I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start a campaign that he do it here. Mm. There you go. Well, we know why he doesn't do it here. Mm. I know because I he's, know. you know, it's it's principle. Yeah, and 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 actually, he's right. Yeah, <laughs> because I thought the girls' school was a terrible choice uh, yeah. as the uh, to be the plug side mm. of but that. But I think, oh, I, I Al, think it was, Al, that's I love girls' Ask school. Him. It's but a great dream. rock song. <laughs> it's an okay rock song, but it's certainly uh, not in the in the class of of Mulligan Tire, which is just a it's a beautiful song. And some you know blockhead at Capitol decided, oh well, the American audience won't know this. Well, so you know, well, uh, you right. know nineteen seventy seven. You know we're we're in the midst of you know two factions. We had you know punk coming yes. over. And we had and, and, and we had disco, you know. We, certainly, you know, Scottish waltzes weren't sweeping the nation. Um, I, I obviously think Mull of Kintyre is, <laughs> is a better song. It's a, it's a beautiful record too. But as a single at the time, I'm not sure a Scottish waltz would have would have made much of an impact here. Yet, who? Yeah. How do you figure it made an impact every other country in the world except? Yeah. Exactly. And I mean, live and let, uh, not live and let die, um, uh, with a little luck, which certainly didn't fall into either of those two camps, mm. was a very big hit. In Number the, one record. In the spring of, in the spring of 78, right in the middle of, yeah. you know, Saturday Night Fever Mania. And, uh, you know, so I, I just uh, have, uh, I, I totally understand why he still kind of holds a grudge about uh, Capital not, you know, not choosing in Mulligan Tire as the A side, but that does, and I don't mean to to get this off on on Mulligan Tire, but that doesn't mm-hmm. mean it wouldn't get a great reception here. You know it would. Oh, of it course would get, it would. I, oh, I think it, it would, would get a it would get a huge reception here. But oh, sure. But I understand. You know, it's a it's, it's principle with him, and Paul has a as we know, and as Mark Lewis and documented in in Tune In. Uh, Paul has a very uh, strong, stubborn streak. Mm-hmm. And oh, when I, he... I, I understand that, but I still, th- I mean, but he, he was, you know, he, he brought out uh, the, the song, the song for uh, the, you know, uh, in Ru- the Russians or the um, Mrs. Um, Mrs. Vanderbilt. Mrs. Vanderbilt. Yeah. He, oh, Mr. he brought, yes. he brought that out when he was, when they asked him to. He's. I mean, there is precedent for him doing this. Now, the the only thing that might stop Mull of Kintyre is the fact that he has to bring a, a you know, a, a well, bagpipe yeah, band. that's true. He's not gonna. He's not gonna have a, you know, a, a pipe band with him on it for every show. Hey, listen, <laughs> right. I, I can. I can. I can well, make they, that they, happen. They could program that. Yeah. Yeah, but you know what? I can make that pipe band happen. You know. Who, you know who is the drum major in the local pipe band here? Andy who? White. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's really? Awesome. He is the drum major in the, in the in the fife and drum corps here. 
Now, Ken, where does the trivia start and end on that one? Okay. <laughs> the guy who played on the first Beatles single, who also uh, the snare drum on Mull of Kintyre. Yeah, wow. that would be that would be really good, but it wouldn't help Steve. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, hey, look, I'm trying here, you know. Yeah. And Alan, were yeah. you implying that uh, that Wix could basically put samples of of the pipes in? It was yes, I. I I well, feel I mean, sure that he could do that, yes. You know, I mean, yeah. it's, it's no different than him so. doing the violins on Eleanor Rigby or something. Yeah, I mean, right, that's what a synthesizer right. is for. Sure. You right. know, I mean, so that you don't have to carry the string right. section. And, again, if you guys want to have the whole should Paul take a horn section on the road, you can dial me in for that show. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd <laughs> much prefer, prefer that. For that. Yeah. Okay. You know, we've gone back and forth many times, Steve and I, on the show about what Paul should do and... You know, the only major complaint that I have to make, and first of all, I feel funny even complaining because I'm grateful that Paul's doing anything and certainly that he's this active touring. But he's at a stage where he knows he's only going to do a limited amount of shows per year. And to please as many people as he can, he's got to play big venues. And the mere fact that he's doing that means that he has to play the most popular numbers that everybody knows. So if it was up to me, my own personal choice, I wish that maybe he'd take a year and just play small venues and go deep into his catalog. But that's probably never going to happen. I mean, there's so many great songs throughout his career that he's never done live before, including big hits, too. And um, it's just a shame that when you do see him live, nowadays it's pretty much 60% Beatles. There's the new album. There's the few core songs from the 70s, Band on the Run, Live and Let Die, Jet, Usually. Um, I know he's been doing uh, Junior's Farm, though he took that out recently. But uh, maybe I'm amazed he does once in a while. But as far as what's sandwiched in between all those other years, the 80s through the recent stuff, there's slim pickings there. So it's not really you know, a great representation of his career decade by decade. You know, So uh, that's my only major complaint. I wish that he would take out a lot of songs. There's got to be a lot of songs from his catalog that he's especially proud of that he's never had a chance to do live, and he probably figures nobody wants to hear it. But the very nature of the fact that he's playing big venues dictates what he has to play, and there's no way that he can't play Hey Jude and Let It Be and Yesterday, mm-hmm. you know, and Band on the Run and Live and Let Die and those core songs. So... uh and like you were saying, Al, and, and I go to a lot of concerts myself, the majority of artists who are out there, there are certain core songs that they play in every single concert, no matter what. Mm-hmm. And then from tour to tour, there are some a few changes, usually. That's how most artists are. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, the Bruce Springsteens of the world, and I bring up Todd Rungman a lot because every tour with him is different. Mm-hmm. So... You know, there's just a few people out there that really change from tour to tour. Otherwise, if, especially if you want to please 50,000 people or any of the big venues, 30 to 50,000, you've got to play those songs. So on the one hand, I'm so grateful that he's doing anything. And by the way, in Albany, he did On My Way to Work. It's the only time he's ever done that song live. And that was a real treat, the fact that he did it there. But to answer your question, Tom, about the four songs from New, I loved all four songs. I wish that he would have changed it a bit, especially as um, Early Days became a video and appreciate there was a video for that. I was kind of hoping that maybe he would focus on some other material instead of keeping it the same four songs. Certainly everybody out there, as soon as I heard that song, and the yeah, name of the tour is pretty, out there. Sure. No, <laughs> you know, I, well, we, you know, I, yeah. you know it's, that was a lock that um, he was going to do that. And uh, Speaking of songs from new, how do all you guys feel about the number of times that we have been asked to buy new again? Um, this year there was uh, yet another incarnation of it with a second disc and, and, and uh, other stuff. I mean, I've bought it actually. I, I've lost track. I mean, <laughs> there was the original release. And since I tend to still get stuff on vinyl as well, there was the the vinyl release too. Then Target put out a version with a couple with an extra track. Then Japan put out a version with two extra tracks, and now there's this new new version. Um, does this seem fair to you guys? He, he does I mean, this for everything. Doesn't. You know, it seems like you know you want to put out an album and say this is my representative work, and this is this is this is the statement I'm making. That said, you know. Look, it's a business like anything else, and he knows he's got fans and he's got extra songs. 
I love the way they did it years ago with Flowers in the Dirt. I think it was a Japanese release, probably, mm-hmm. where you got mm-hmm. the album, yeah. and then there was a, du- a double-disc version that said, here's all the B-sides and the remixes and the dance tracks and the you know, all the spaghetti was put on a separate disc. And it, you right. Know, and, you know, you might have got a duplication of, you know, okay, whatever, Figure of Eight is on the main album, and there's a remix or a dance mix of Figure of Eight on the, you know, bonus disc. But that's a good way, I think, to kind of still keep the you know the you know, the the proper album intact, not you know, just start throwing songs onto the end of it and things, and then have something special for fans and collectors. It really makes a, a nice way to do it, rather than you know to Alan's point. I mean, on the day of release, if you wanted to if you wanted to have all the songs. Well, you had to get it from Japan and from Target and get the DVD. Mm-hmm. And, just, and and if you really needed that stupid little light-up cube, you had to go to, <laughs> right. to uh, <laughs> what was it? Not I'm ready to say Record World. It's not Record World. It's uh, uh, Best Buy. Well, it's all, the, all the indie, all the indies had it. It was the indies. Oh, that had okay. That. Yeah. Um, so you know they they got a bit gimmicky, and then this year the package that came out was beautiful, by the way. You know, with mm-hmm. the DVD and all, mm-hmm. you know. All the bonus cuts, by the way, plus some new bonus cuts. Uh, uh, right. You know, so it's it's just kind of hard. I mean, you know, we're we're such diehard fans. When the album comes out, we're gonna either download it or buy it. You know, if we had one ounce of self control, we'd say, you know what, I'll buy it a year a year later and get the definitive <laughs> version and see see how this all shakes out. You know. You know, uh, I did hear I did hear some people say that uh, that they were gonna wait because they knew he would do that. So yeah. it's you know it's not totally. There were people that realized that he was going to pull that. Um, I think it's a. Yeah. I don't. Think, I think it's really a lousy thing to do. I, I, I would know. agree. You know. Over and over and over again. I mean, I do mean, it. Even, they, you, you know. know if we I'm, get back to the, the to the 2014 thing. I mean, I couldn't believe that that extended to a tribute album made to him, right? Unless you bought the two hundred dollar mm-hmm. big Mac Daddy deluxe version. You know, with the vinyl and the CD and art prints and everything else for two hundred bucks to get all the tracks, you had to go to four different retailers. Yeah. Okay. That's you know, and then they wonder why people pass this stuff around and post it for free on the internet. That's a double a double disc, by the way. So even on a good day, that's going to cost you twenty bucks retail at whatever Target or Best Buy and uh, Walmart. And then there was the one that you had to buy online at iTunes to get the two extra tracks. Um, you know, for a total of eight extra tracks that ran a total of about 16 minutes, because they're <laughs> pretty short, too, um, you know, you had to go all over creation and get and get all this stuff. And again, I know, you know, that the cynics will say, quit your complaining. You didn't have to do anything. OK, true enough. But, you know, this this is why um, we get by with a little help from our friends, as, yes. as they say. And, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and and they somehow magically arrive here. So mm-hmm. that's true. But if you're if you're collecting it also as a collector of the stuff, you you know that you need the originals and you need the legitimate ones. And yeah. I mean, need in, in quotes, I realize. Mm-hmm. But sure. um, but, you know, and it and it does seem in a certain way that he's taking particularly unfair advantage of his staunchest fans, really. But it's, but it's nothing new because he's I mean, he's been doing that since the 80s. But or contrast before. it with contrast that with the Beatles policy of not putting their singles on their album so that yeah. you get the extra bit of added value for money if you buy both the single and the album. Uh-huh. Kind of a little different. Mm. Very different. But you know, it's been different through the years. One thing that I, I always loved about Paul was when the the import C D singles came out and you would get two or three mm-hmm. extra songs. And you'd spend fifteen dollars for that, and I thought it was really worth it. But you know, in the course of one album, you could have two or three CD singles, like Off the Ground was, mm. you know, and you got all these terrific tracks, and you might be plunking down thirty, forty extra dollars that way. So I think mm-hmm. what Paul realizes is that there are collectors out there, and while it's kind of frustrating that they're spending this much money for for a true collector, this is like a dream. You know, because a lot of the stuff becomes collector's items, and he's certainly providing a lot for them if they, so, if, they like, if they like collector's items at all. I personally couldn't care less 
about getting the Target version and the Best Buy version. As long as I have everything in one package, I'm happy. Well, that, was, there's that, one, that was that, you know, the approach that he took mm-hmm. with the at least the Japanese Flowers in the Dirt. And I think there was one also for Off the Ground. There that was. Part, yeah, yes. they had all the B-sides. And, and again, yes. who wins here? Everybody. He gets all the material out. People pay a higher price for it. But, and by the way, when those albums came out, things like Amazon and eBay didn't exist. Didn't exist yet. We had to no. drive to God knows where to find them <laughs> at, at the store and ask people to hold them and, and do sure. mail order and everything else. You know, it, it made it really difficult to, to actually do it. Right now, I mean, you can get anything, you know, obviously in 10 minutes, you find on, on eBay or Amazon or something online. But, you know, having it all in one place, it, it right. kind of, you know, helped everybody. The collectors mm-hmm. got all the extra material, paid for it. That's fine. So it wasn't like it was being, you know, pirated or, or bootlegged or anything. People who just said, you know what? Oh, there's a new Paul McCartney album out. I'd love to hear that. Could just go buy the album and didn't have to spend, you know, double for a deluxe version and everything else. And everybody kind of wins that way. Um, you know, the, the multiple iterations that, you know, to Ken's point about the CD singles, they, they got to a point, you may remember, where there would be, let's say, two CD singles for a single release. So there'd be mm. figure of eight, you know, in a standard, whatever, seven-inch vinyl format. Then there'd be right. two CD singles with maybe three songs apiece on them, and two of the songs would overlap. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you yep. only got the one extra song by buying yeah. a third disc. I mean, you know, it got, right. it got nuts. You know, just compiling them all together, which, by the way, people then do. And, you know, release them as, as pirate compilation. It's called, you know, whatever. The complete off-the-ground B-sides or something mm-hmm. like that. And, you know, and then, and then everybody gets their, their dander up saying, oh, this is piracy and they can't do this. Well, you know, look, you, you, you know, look at the beast you created. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. I was going to say, to, to, def- to I'll defend McCartney a little bit, he's not the only one that does this. Oh, no. Oh, no, of course not. And I mean, the thing is that the people who do it are people like Britney Spears and, you know, all that ilk, you know, and it's really it's really kind of crazy that he that he does this along, you know, along those lines. It, it's especially with new. I mean, new is just and and I uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there's more if, if there we have yet another version. Coming. I ain't buying that album ever again. Never. again. <laughs> well, in, 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 in five or ten years, when they get up to new. In the archive series collection, there'll be um, yet another version with maybe a fourth disc of, oh my. of there, material. There we go. Well, so. You know, I, I've said on the show with Steve, if you remember when New first came out or before it was coming out, Paul was talking about this song called Secret Life of a Party Girl, which mm. never ended up being released at all. Yeah. <laughs> That's so right. So there's, there's still more material mm-hmm. there. But, um, you know, why wasn't there an outcry all these years when you had singles that weren't on albums, which forced you to buy the singles? And then you had B-sides that weren't on albums. It forced you to buy the singles. You know, same thing, Beatles and Solo. Nobody was crying about that then. This is just taking it a lot further, but you're still getting extra material. And in the case of the Deluxe New, you're not only getting these bonus songs, but you got a DVD there, which I thought was pretty good overall. Yeah, There's a lot of material on there. The difference, Ken, is you're not buying the same tracks over and over again. That's true. That's the difference. Yeah. No, I agree with you there. Okay. You know, there's no reason why you should have to keep buying the new album over and over and over again to get everything else. I'm okay with it if you flip it around for a minute and say, okay, I don't know, Bruce Springsteen has a new album out. It's called Born in the USA. Okay, I'm a Bruce fan. I go buy the record. They they pluck Dancing in the Dark as the single. Okay? Typically, I would have no interest in going and buying that single until I said, oh, wait, if you flip it over, help me out here, Al, Pan Cadillac. Mm-hmm, I think so, yeah. Okay, Pink Cadillac, a really cool little rockabilly song, is on the B-side of that, and I say, okay, you know, now I'll go buy the single, okay, because I'm getting something for it. By the way, it helps the sales chart, not that I would have, you know, not that that would be my motivation, mm-hmm. but you can understand that as a business motive, saying, well, you know, people who aren't big Bruce fans, we're we're making a bet here that Dancing in the Dark will appeal to enough people that they'll buy the single and it may lead to some album sales and it'll push the album and, and the single up the chart. That's what a record company exec got paid to do. Okay? The underside of that is, well, Bruce has fans who will have gone and bought that album because they love Bruce and, and they've heard the songs and they're anxious to hear, you know, what he's up to and 
and they're going to go out and buy this album sight unseen or unheard okay and they're going to buy that how do we get them to help you know to 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 make this 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 lead track a hit okay and and you know giving that little bit of value there was you know that that was you know standard fare that i think everybody can can you know live with but you mm-hmm. know have, you know when you mm-hmm. when, if, when they then said okay then there's a cd single and you'll get the dance mix of dancing in the dark and pink cadillac and one more song okay we're going to put out a second cd single with those three and one more now you've yeah. multiple multiple versions and that you know that that's where you know the 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 charm tends to wear off pretty quick so okay. how many copies do we each have of Venus and Mars? Probably not many of, of Wings of the Speed of Sound, although I probably have six or seven at least. But um, <laughs> Venus and Mars, that's one that we've bought many, 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 many times. And here it is again. Well, uh, so this, uh, you know, <laughs> the, again, if we're going to say many times, are we counting like going back to 1975 <laughs> and buying the vinyl? I mean, you know, buying it in different formats, vinyl than to. Yeah, CD, absolutely. That's that's different. Mm-hmm. But yeah, even on CD, Venus and Mars, and you want the like, yes, well and vinyl, you know, is on the <laughs> the fourth iteration. You know, the, certainly you start you know throwing imports into into the mix. You know, you had the McCartney. I'd say on C on CD, there's been yeah four or five. Yeah, I, I can think of four off the top of my head. Um, mm. You know, there was the standard version, and there was the expand. And there's the the gold one. Yeah, right. And I the, have, I have the, the Japanese one. Mm. Right, and then the, 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 the 93 reissue. Yep. Mm-hmm. And right. there was a surround sound one. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know if, if you guys have that. There was It came out briefly in a surround sound mix, no, a DTS. Yeah. Anyone have that? No. But no. I do remember when that 93 <laughs> series came out, what, what made it even more convoluted is that the British CDs had already been issued with bonus cuts, then they reissued them into this 93, whatever it was called, the Ar- not, not Archive series, but the Paul McCartney Collection series. Yes. Yeah. And they reshuffled the bonus cuts. Mm-hmm. So something yep. that might have been a bonus cut on, on Wildlife was now mm-hmm. a bonus cut on Red Rose Speedway or something. Yeah. And you said, oh, my God, you know, <laughs> how many versions do I have to keep? You know, because even, you know, theoretically, with each upgrade, theoretically, you might be able to bring the old one back to a store and get a couple of bucks, or you hand it off to, you know, a friend or a cousin or a neighbor or something that didn't have it, and you say, here, you know, buy the work. Or you put it, that's the one you take in the car, or that's the one you leave in the office, whatever you do with it. You know, here you you had to go up to look at your actual collection and say, okay, I've got three copies of whatever, Venus and Mars, side by side. Why am I keeping this one? Oh, because it has... Whatever it has, my carnival on it. Why am I keeping this one? Oh, because it has odd socks on it. Mm. Why am I keeping this one? Oh, because it had whatever else it had. Um, <laughs> you know, it's 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 you know, it got to be ridiculous. Yeah, to go Same to go up. back. Oh, well, I just wanted to go back for a minute on the art of McCartney. I think that really killed that that album completely. To to put those tracks in so many places that was really ridiculous well sure because you know for starters it'll still fit on two cds okay that's you know the 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 quick arithmetic but it also you know that wasn't a what you're going to call a cohesive project that was you know it it is by its nature a collection of various artists doing right you know a a cross sampling of his catalog and adding one more song or two more songs or whatever it came out to eight more songs for what it's worth you know they could have taken you know a previously released one, or who knows, there may be more in the can. Maybe Billy Joel did a third song. Who mm-hmm. knows? Yeah. Uh, I, I hope I don't have to buy that record again. I I bought one copy. Uh, you know, I, th- I thought that was enough. Right. Uh, I I didn't I didn't buy it at all. I I didn't really. I mean, I heard the uh, I heard the downloads in advance of the release, and I didn't think it was that special. I really didn't. I found it had um, you know it had some some terrific moments. That I thought what made it. What made it not special was too much of it sounded like Paul's band, which uh-huh. which it is, and it they is. said, "Okay, let's have you know Paul's band do. Let's make up a track, Junior's Farm, and instead of Paul singing it, it's Steve Miller." Now yeah. I get that it's a guitar drenched song. It's from it's very era specific. Uh, you know, Miller was huge around the time that record came out, you know, but with the Joker mm-hmm. and Fly Like an Eagle and those records. Mm-hmm. I, I get the A&R connection there, and, you know, that's a good one, but 
when you listen to that song now, you go, I don't know about you, I hear it and I go, man, I'd really rather hear Paul McCartney sing this. Indeed. Where, no, where, I, where no, I thought it did succeed was when people took the song and you know, put their own stamp on it, like the Toots Hibbert with Sly and Robbie doing a reggae version of Come and Get It. I thought it worked right. terrific. Sometimes an artist and a song just sound great together, like Wanderlust being done by Brian Wilson. Exactly. You know, and again, that just shows that, you know, a, a great song is a great song is a great song is a mm -hmm. great song. Um, that, one, that one translated real, real well. Uh, and, and there are a few like that, that, but very few of the ones that were done, what I'm going to call straight, you know, it kind of gets you to saying, well, why, 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 did, why do I need to hear this? I mean, it's cool that they did it, but... Why? Why do I need to hear, you know, some of some of these straightforward reads when, you know, they're they're not going to match the original if if all that's being you know swiped out is a vocal. I mean, right. there's gonna be very few people going to out sing Paul McCartney on a Paul McCartney song. Mm -hmm. so. Well put. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, I pretty much agree with you, Tom, on this. And uh, the songs that really shine for me are the ones where the artists put their own stamp on it and really don't have Paul's backing band on it. Yeah. And we, we did a show on this. And for me, like Smokey Robinson doing so bad mm -hmm. uh, and Wanderlust and Brian Wilson, those were real highlights. And actually um, I liked BB King doing on the way. I thought yeah. that was pretty cool. That version of no more lonely nights mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. was, was very yeah. different from that independent band whose name ex escapes me at the moment. But uh you know, those were the real highlights for me. And I would have loved to have seen, because we even talked about Junior's Farm with Steve Miller, where I've always kind of felt that stylistically, Junior's Farm is very much like Rock and Me mm. and uh, like Jet Airliner, very similar, you know, stylistically. So I would have loved for Steve Miller with his band to do the song. Yeah. Instead of with, with Paul's it's back. Paul's band, band. You know? Yeah. yeah. You know, I would love Billy Joel has great musicians in his band. Have Billy Joel with his band doing Live and Let Die and Maybe Up Amazed. Yeah. You know? Actually, those, those were the ones, you know, we've talked about the ones where we said, eh, you know, big deal. We've talked about a few that shined. I'm about as big a Billy Joel fan as you'll find. And I, right. I want to love him doing two of my favorite Paul <laughs> right. I want to love those two records. And I just don't. I think yeah. you know, his voice sounds very strained and very, you know, it's almost almost like he's 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 trying too hard to do it. I got, you know, Billy Joel, again, one of my absolute all time favorite artists and absolutely my favorite Paul McCartney song. Maybe I'm amazed and I want to love it and I don't. And that that that's disappointing. Yeah, mm -hmm. very much yeah. so. Mm. So back to the archive reissues, what did you guys yeah. think of the bonus tracks on, on Venus and Mars and Speed of Sound Well, first and the of all, DVD me, material? Yeah, let me just talk about Venus and Mars because Venus and Mars to me was one of the big highlights of the year because, um, you know, usually I complain about Paul not giving enough bonus material, but at least on the CD, you got 14 tracks there. There's a decent amount of material. And in particular, I love the demos for 4th of July, which mm. I thought was just, that was amazing. I never even knew there was a demo. You, you pretty much, should we always assume there's a demo for everything? Well, I, but, I think uh, you know, somewhere, you know, since he's not notating music, if he's, if he's doing a, you know, something to, to get it copyrighted or to, to, to demo or to give to someone, whether, whether that demo tape is still has survived or exists is a right. matter, but that's probably how he's, you know, how he's you know, done it when he recorded it. And, you know, that's, that's a rare enough song to try and find the, uh, the official version of. Um, that's true, right. You know, and trying to get, you know, and, and I never thought I'd see the day where I got to hear Paul's version of it. Uh, it's hard enough to find the, the John Christie version. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, and it's a cool little song. I've always loved Fourth of July. So that, mm -hmm. that, was, nice. that to me was a highlight of that set. Yeah, Let's Love, the demo mm -hmm. was really Love. nice. It's, Especially the fact that it wasn't the one from One Hand Clapping. Right. And also to hear the early version of Rock Show was cool. Um, That's to true. hear Soily, Soily in its entirety from One Hand Clapping was really great. Such an edgy song, mm. you know. And I always loved the live version of it from Wings Over America, but it really translates well as a studio recording there. Right. You know, to me, it, it's kind of a drawback when you've got Junior's Farm and Sally G again. You know, it's mm -hmm. not like it's unreleased material. The same thing with Walking in the Park with Eloise and Bridge on the River Suite. That's already come out on CD. Well, but I understand. What's nice now is that it's the full 
Junior's Farm on CD, and somebody can take Paul's copy of Wingspan away. <laughs> and maybe, maybe when he does it live, he'll do the whole thing. <laughs> okay, that that would be nice. But uh, the the demos, Ken, back to the demos and the stuff that came from uh, you know the alternate stuff and the, the the stuff we hadn't had previously. As we said before, you know, Paul always had these you know different ways to get bonus material and stuff. And this time, we at least have to give a tip of the hat. The way he did the the tracks via paulmccartney.com, they were just out there and you could download them for free. It wasn't right. like you had to buy the you know what the whole Venus and Mars box set from paulmccartney.com right. to get the bonus downloads. Uh, the mm -hmm. downloads were made available, um, you know, pretty much you know to anybody who wanted them. So that that was kind of cool because you might remember the the fiasco with. Um, with the standards album with uh, Kisses on uh, yes. where you know you know the the bonus tracks were only available to UK subscribers i mean it just you know it was completely overthought and completely you know over bungled uh, and then and then of course he he put them all out through iTunes right. later right mhm mm mm -hmm. yeah. with more extra songs right yeah. <laughs> yeah. but uh but this time through i think there were three songs one of them was kind of a little like a jingle almost um right there was a, a you know yet another alternate of rock show, and an, and a second alternate of letting go. So mm -hmm. those were cool to kind of have. You know, if you wanted to get them and download them or burn them or whatever you you wanted, you could do it. Yet you you know the whole box set didn't have to be rebought or you didn't have to buy the whole thing digitally. You know, I mean to me, you know, a, a digital download on something like this seems kind of. It seems kind of, you know, contrary to what they're trying to do. They're trying to make a lavish, deluxe package, something you could hold, something you can see, something you can mm -hmm. smell and taste if you want. Um, mm -hmm. To me, I'm not sure where the, where the lure is in downloading the songs. I, I get downloading yeah. it, you know, in addition to that, you want to take it, you know, on your portable player or something. I get that, um, but not instead of, you know, in addition to, or it's actually as part of, right? You still get the little download card in the box where you can go get the songs electronically. Mm -hmm. right. we, we still, we still like the physical stuff. That's what yes. we, well, but yeah. I mean, it's, it's not Absolutely. a matter of like, it's just a matter of what the, the whole point is of doing a, a deluxe like this. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you, you could kill somebody with that Ram box, <laughs> drop it out the window, uh, and drop it on somebody's head. I mean, all the, the posters and the, the tour itineraries and the lyric sheets and everything else that, that seems to be the point of doing the archive series. You know, and I love that. I oh, really love. You sign me up for the next one. Sure. You know, one of the things that I love about some of these deluxe box sets, and we have it with Venus and Mars, and Speed of Sound, is the, the handwritten lyrics. Oh. And you've got them for almost right. every single song on Venus and Mars, except for Call Me Back Again. Yeah. And uh, for whatever reason, I don't know how it's done. It's got to be done digitally. But you look at it. You're holding it in your hands, and you think that Paul just wrote it. It looks that clear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, and it's absolutely amazing <laughs> that they can do that uh, well, in this day and age with today's technology. Well, you know, that's it's like again, you handed the paper to you. You know. That that's the point. You know, I mean, again, uh, how can you appreciate that if you downloaded it? I'm I'm not sure. Looking at that on a screen is really doing it. Uh, holding right. that paper in your hands. I think. You know. I think the downloads don't even come with that stuff. So. I, you know the downloads may be for people who um who either who just aren't interested in the physical extras of the book but just want the songs and perhaps whose budget is uh, are more suited to that well they have um, made because these are expensive but they yeah. are beautifully done they have made though a couple of the earlier archive ones i believe well wings uh wings over america and i forget what the second one was uh the all of the bonus material from the uh the art you know the deluxe version available as a as a digital download yeah that they do that digital booklets yeah but that's yeah exactly and which i you know to me that does it on an ipad it just doesn't work quite as well as having yeah. the book in your hand mm -hmm. right mm. and i also love the fact that if you take a look at these deluxe box box sets you've got really great photos from linda that you've never seen before mm -hmm. and you've got the history of the band there i mean if you look at the venus and mars box set there's the whole story of how wings evolved and talking about how jeff Britton was in the band if only temporarily yeah you know and jimmy mccullough coming coming into the fold as well as as joe english and 
learning about uh, going over to, to uh, Junior's farm, Curly Putnam's farm, and recording there. You know, you've got a few pages devoted to that, and that was really nice. And you've also got Paul with the Speed of Sound uh, box set giving an explanation to each song on the album, which was very nice. I mean, how else are you ever going to hear Paul McCartney talk about Wino Junko? It's never going to happen <laughs> anywhere else. Right. Got to buy this box set. <laughs> I don't know if it's that important to you, but, uh, you know, that or Denny's songs like Time to Hide. You've got quotes there from Paul and from Denny, too. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, the, the, the quotes, as you say, Ken, on Wino Junko, I, I, I look at that even on a bigger level and say just hearing him, you know, recall Jimmy McCulloch, you know, who's yeah. such a big part of the, the glory years. Yeah. Uh, just, you know, just Paul, you know, remembering him kind of is kind of special all to itself. Mm-hmm. True. Yeah, because he really hasn't, uh, except for I think a couple of comments that he made, you know, right after Jimmy's death. I don't re- recall him really uh, saying much about Jimmy over the years since then. Yeah, a little bit in wingspan. He used to just tell that one story yes. about uh, when Jimmy didn't want to come out and do the encore yeah. one night. And he said, oh, you're going to do it. You know? <laughs> and, and he went out and played a blinder. You know, he tells the story, uh, the, that one I think, of, I want to say the Boston concert or something like that. Mm-hmm. But uh, that was really all he ever spoke much about in terms of Jimmy's you know, tenure with Wayne. Right. Now now conversely there's the the DVDs in each mm. box and they're not nearly as well done as the as the audio material mm-hmm. and, or the or the, the the text material. Right. Right. You know like for instance uh well you could have done this either with uh Venus and Mars or Wings at the Speed of Sound. They had an absolute, uh, a, the perfect chance to put, because when the tour first started in September of, of 75, one of the first shows on the tour was professionally recorded on video. Mm. Uh, Wings over Sydney, Tom? Uh, Melbourne. Melbourne, yes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, was professionally done. Oh, it's been and, it's been in circulation in beautiful quality. Yeah, exactly. And mm. you, you know, even if you didn't have the entire concert on there, at least have a good chunk of it. Mm. Not a thing. Yeah. yeah, you know, I, I the only disappointment in both box sets are the DVDs, really. Yes. But the the what I do like um, on Venus and Mars was the uh, Bon Voyageur. You know, that was. Uh, that was a decent, what was it, 13 minutes, just showing Paul in New Orleans on that riverboat, and he's given a press conference, and you saw him jam a bit with, uh, what was the name of the band, the, the Mardi Gras, the Mardi Gras band? Um, oh. uh, the Meters, the Meters. Yes. Were, uh, mm, yeah. Right. I know, that was pretty cool. So, um, you know, but just to get the, the TV ad for Venus and Mars, and, and it was nice to see the recording session for My Carnival, uh, or My Carnival. Uh, just adding the backing vocals to that, that's nice. But you know there's so much more that exists. Sure. So I just don't know why, you know, how much material is there on the DVD? 20 minutes? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, the the Speed of Sound DVD, I like the uh, Wings at Elstree, although that was that was pretty short, too. Mm-hmm. That was only about 13 minutes, I think. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I would have loved to have seen the whole thing, even if it wasn't in the best of quality. So, um even you know. if you had the, you know, uh, what was done on um, on Wings Over America and have, uh, what was it, the six audio tracks from, from the Cow Palace show. You know, right. even if you did that on the DVD and just had maybe six songs, it's more, it's better than 15, 13 minutes. Mm-hmm. And there were actually some of those songs from the, the start of that tour um, that had some songs that he hadn't played certainly before, some he hadn't played since. Oh, uh-huh. uh, you know, until you know, thirty years later. But I, I believe that Melbourne show has the McCulloch lineup doing Junior's Fall. Yes, I mean that. Right. How many more of those are there? And mm-hmm. I believe the at the early outset of that tour, they were still doing the Little Woman Loves Sea Moon medley. That's that, right. Which, which they had done on the '72 and '73 tours, but with a different Wings lineup. So this would have been the only way they would have heard McCulloch in English 
right. uh, on those songs. So, if, yeah, Al, if I had to pick a half dozen from that to, to, to put on a, a little mini CD mm-hmm. bonus, that might work. Yep. <laughs> I, I, I beat Junior's easily. Farm, uh, Little Woman Love, and Sea Moon, and, and then pick three other ones. I really don't care. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What did you guys think of the bonus CD for Speed of Sound? I'll tell you, I, I delighted in the demo of Silly Love Songs mm-hmm. because it was so intimate. Um, it's the three of them. Are, it's, it's really not a demo. It's some form of a vocal rehearsal. Clearly, he's, it's not him writing the song. The other two are singing the, their backup parts perfectly. Um, but it's, it's some sort of a vocal rehearsal or warm-up or something. And it, it, it's the antithesis of the, you know, the polished, you know, fully produced horn section, you know, full big bass line, uh, fully produced number that it became. Right. I, I love that kind of stuff, hearing him work out vocal parts and, um, you know, the, the raw run-throughs and stuff. That, to me, was a, was a highlight of that disc. You know, when yeah, you talk about that particular demo, um, you know, I, I love, when, I, when you go back to the Beatles anthology and you hear the evolution of certain songs and you hear that certain songs weren't finished, mm-hmm. um, you know, like Got to Get You Into My Life wasn't completely finished, or And I Love Her didn't have that middle part, A Love Like Ours Would Never Die, that wasn't in that the anthology version. Mm-hmm. Likewise, with Silly Love Songs, you don't have the... Love doesn't come in a minute. Sometimes yeah. it doesn't come at all. So I, I, I find all that stuff fascinating because you're hearing the song in an earlier stage before it's fully developed. So I love that kind of stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, the problem is that he doesn't put enough of it. He just barely... I mean, he, you know that there's tons of this stuff. And, I mean, a lot of stuff's been bootlegs, you know, and uh, he just barely samples it. And it's just too bad that he doesn't go a little deeper. Sure, there was that whole that whole batch of outtakes and things, much of which was from that era that came out. Tom, I think it was about two years ago. I think right. Uh, yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. yep. And uh, you know, there, there's obviously a lot of stuff from there that could have been included. Right. Well, the the version of "Must Do Something About yes. It." Paul on vocals, that's from exactly. that. Yep. that bootleg exactly. Bit. And it's nice to hear that. It, those are the kind of things like um, I always loved on the bootlegs when you got a different vocalist on a certain song. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I know it's a different album, but like getting closer, Denny Lane singing it. Mm-hmm. It would be nice to hear the note you never wrote, Paul singing it. You know, yeah. it's that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So uh, especially since he wrote it. But uh, that's just, you know, a nice little extra to get on, on the CD. And I especially love the demo for She's My Baby, because I think that really works on, you know, with just Paul on a piano. And I love that. Mm-hmm. What did we think I, of the version of Beware of My Love with John Bonham? Mm-hmm. I could have done without the disco uh, the drumming. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I mean, otherwise it was, yeah, otherwise it was, it was fine. You know, I thought it sounded, I thought it sounded real good. Mm-hmm. I didn't think no. it was a. Spe- I I think it, it, the hype, it, it was overhyped. I don't think, and I wasn't real thrilled with it. I mean, I it wasn't one of the highlights. I thought the the demos that you were just talking about were better. Mm-hmm. But right, I mean, you would never know that that was John Bonham playing right. drums on them because it, was, it wasn't overly special. Yeah. No, not at all. Yeah, but Paul seems to have either thought so or thought that everybody else would think so because that was the one that he tended. To, to promote in his, you know, Twitter talks and that kind of thing. Yes. You know, that, that, that was, uh, here's a surprise for you all. Mm-hmm. Um, well, who's ever, so, who's ever so, telling so, him about social media yeah. got, got the, he got that right. Cause that, that got a quite a buzz right away. So, right. So I guess that may bring us to um, the video game song that he contributed. And I guess part of the orchestral score for that too. Oh, hope for the future. <laughs> yes, exactly. And since you're love, the expert I've... on or, or orchestral scores, Alan, uh, why don't we get your take? Well, you know, it's hard to tell what was Paul's and what was the uh, the the other guys who worked on that game. Um, one of whom actually brought Paul in and then was fired by the game company, and I believe may not have actually gotten credit. 
Oh. It's it's hard to know because uh, he, he talked. I, I can't remember his name is Marty something, I and mean, he's apparently a, a, a very big video game music guy. Um, he came to Paul with what he said was an hour of material, and Paul may have added to that. Uh, apparently, did add to that, uh, and they sent ba- ideas back and forth. Um, but it's a collaborative score, so there's there's no way to really know what Paul's contribution to that was. It's, you know, it's a good dramatic score if you like video game scores, and um, those things are fairly hot these days. The theme song, I didn't think much of, to tell you the truth. I, I know some of you guys have a different opinion. To me, it seemed, um, you know, a lot of the times... Paul, you know, he's he said perhaps glibly, you know, that, you know, John and I wouldn't spend more than two hours on a song. I mean, I, I think his limit these days is about 15 minutes. If he can't get it written in 15 minutes, that's about it. And this sounds like it was done in about that. And we know that he can do that. You know, we, he can write a song in 15 minutes, but it sounds like this. So um, I don't know. It, to me, it just seemed a little cliched and what you would have expected. I mean, if he was going to do that, I, I wish he had just put Hope of Deliverance on there. It was pretty much the, the same thing, and that, that's a better song. Kind of the oh. same theme, yeah. Uh, I, yeah. It's funny. Uh, when I first heard it, I thought, this is just, you know, product. And mm-hmm. but but in subsequent listenings, the song, the, the you know hope hope for the future, has really grown on me, and uh, I, I find that I, I like I like it a lot now. You know I, I do I, I I do too because and, and I have not seen the game, but I can just picture the song over the you know from the the picture they've sent out of the game uh i can just picture the song on top of that and i think i think it's a great song uh, i i i yeah it sounds like product and and after the way uh alan you and uh, al have described it i'm going well i don't you know maybe i maybe i you know i'm i'm judged it too quickly but i really like it i think it's i think it's a great song by the way it's marty o'donnell that got fired from bungie right right yeah so hmm how about you, Tom? I thought it was, it sounded almost a bit contrived. I mean, hope for the future. That's, that's kind of a big statement to begin with. And, you know, the lyrics follow suit there. It's, it's, I think it's intended to sound grandiose, you know, with, with you know, all the effects and everything that, that must be going on in the game and everything. I like it as a song, uh, though it does sound uh, maybe forced a bit, maybe, you know, maybe a bit contrived. Uh, a bit cliche, you know, again, hope for the future. That's, you know, you guys. Well, got you see, the thing is, the, <laughs> the thing about the game is the game is, you know, the, the, the sort of last surviving city on Earth. And you have to get all these uh, weapons to repel the invaders and all that stuff, which, by the way, I thought was kind of a violent theme for Paul to be working in. Um, mm. uh, it, it, it's funny as well that, you know, he said in one of his interviews that he didn't feel, you know, he wanted it to be thematically related to the game, you know, hope for the future that you're going to, you know, save the last human city and, and, and rebuild earth. But he didn't want to specifically refer to stuff in the game since it had to be a standalone single. And he said, right. you know, if I did it about space invaders, you know, people would say, what's he on about? Which I guess explains why Paul didn't write Ziggy Stardust and the spiders from Mars. Right. <laughs> <laughs> True. I you know I I still I still like the song I I you know I've listened to the song separately many times and I I really enjoy listening to it and I'm not one of those people that you know that latch on to everything he writes um, and I think I thought this was really good so what can well I, say? I definitely I, I think that this was one of the biggest highlights of the year for me mm-hmm. hope for the future I just think it's a marvelous song I think Paul's vocals sound great. I do like the lyrics, even if it is cliched. Um, it suits what he's trying to do here, and he wants the song to be more, you know, generic, if you will. But the production is absolutely tremendous. It has such a full sound. He was looking for an epic sound, and it mm-hmm. certainly, you know, you got to give credit there to Giles Martin. I think, you know, the whole record, it's, it's a great song, and it's a great record. It's a great recording. I, I could see it working as a soundtrack song. To a movie just as well as for a video game you know i don't want to make comparisons to live and let die because we've had you know 40 
one forty two years of loving live and let die as a song, mm-hmm. but uh you know I really like uh the whole sound and the and the melody and the structure and everything behind it. It sounds like a full song to me it doesn 't really sound like something that he wrote in fifteen minutes. There are certain songs in paul 's career that I would say it sound like he wrote in fifteen minutes i don't i wouldn 't call this one of them he 's got an album that it sounds like he did it. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for that. I know you were. <laughs> uh, which one, Tom? Uh, that would be the first Wings album. Oh, right. <laughs> hey, I, I think uh, sometime in the future, I just saw an article that was written about wildlife, really praising it. And I'd like to uh, share that, that article with you guys and do a show on this, because it's taking a completely different look at that album and why we should admire Paul for releasing the album, and how daring it was for him to put out something so quickly, you know, when you would expect him only a couple of years prior to be recording something so, so perfect and polished as Abbey Road with the Beatles to turn around and do something like this at the time. But, you know, that's, we'll save that for another show. Mm. <laughs> But definitely hope for the future, I would, I would say, is uh, I thought it was a dynamite song. It was a great way to end the year, I think, by releasing that one. It was. It, was, yeah, it, is, it is a good record. It's a very good record. It's very, as you say, Ken, well, well produced, well recorded. It presents really well as, as a song. You know, how, how will that, how, who would cover that one on, on Art of McCartney 2? Let me ask you that. <laughs> And, and what what would they do with it? I'm not sure. David Bowie. Well, we we don't know. We don't know. <laughs> is that a song that you just automatically think is so separate to Paul that nobody can cover it? No, I mean, I, if, I just you want, if you want, it, it, it if has you want... a lot of a lot of you know room to to do anything with it. I mean, it's it's a, it's a grand sounding record. Mm-hmm. You know, where where do you go with that? Okay, well, I think it works on that level. Mm. Oh, on that level, it absolutely doesn't. Uh, you, as you mentioned before, it's it sounds like a soundtrack song. It yes. sounds uh-huh. like it should be playing over the credits in a movie, or you yeah. know, at, at some some you know well well placed, well timed scene in a movie. It definitely sounds that way. It's it's got very much a, a you know a, a a theatrical production uh, you know, value to it. Well, I don't think any less of the song for that reason. Oh, I, I don't either. You know, you could very well say, I mean, Live and Let Die was a soundtrack song, but it's become so much, a, you know, part of his live act, and it's become a classic now, yeah, well, and yet but... it works. It works on radio still, Live and Let Die, and it has a grandiose feel to it. Okay, you but know? You know, that one, I could see, you know, I, I still see him doing that in virtually every live concert he does. It, you know, and again, the theatrics and the fireworks because of the James Bond thing and the laser lights, I, I get all right. that. But that song translates well into that arena. I'm not sure Hope for the Future would translate well into a, into a live number. Well, yeah. given symphony... how Paul, Paul in general, when he does his live shows, he'll play songs from his new album, and then the next tour, you won't hear those songs again for the yeah. most part. So it, he doesn't seem to have much faith mm. in his recent material. You know, it's, it's, it's like I said, it's basically Beatles, the core songs from the 70s, and he just... A slim, a slim amount from the 80s on up. That doesn't mean that music isn't worthy of being performed and on a regular basis and on several tours, you know? Now, now I do have a little piece of trivia for you guys. Okay. Um, okay. You actually, and to be honest, you have to be a baseball fan to actually know <laughs> this. Uh-oh. <laughs> All right. Now, we know, obviously, when Paul played in Kansas City, that he obviously performed Kansas City. Mm. Right. When the Kansas City Royals clinched the American League Championship in uh, in late October uh, to go on to the World Series, which they lost to the San Francisco Giants, Steve. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> When the when the uh, when the, the final out was recorded, the first piece of music heard right after they the Right after the final out, when the, the players, you know, ran out in the field and did the the traditional dog pile, was right. the Beatles version of Kansas City. Oh. Hmm. How about I that? Thought it was life. Yeah. Thought it was life with the lions. So, yeah. 
I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Mets fan. What is this World Series you speak of? Yes, it's, uh, it's this. Uh, <laughs> yes, really. <laughs> I, I, I always thought that there actually wasn't a World Series if the Yankees weren't in it. it it's canceled on years that the Yankees mm-hmm. don't actually yes. clinch the pennant. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's this uh, this uh, series of games that uh, that they play in late October, and uh, once upon a time they did play it in Flushing. Oh yes, at a at a at a it at, is, at, it is at a, a rare a, treat <laughs> at a ballpark which no longer exists. As a it matter is, of fact, it is a rare treat. Yes, yes, and I think it's a crime that ballpark doesn't exist anymore. But that's just me. Yeah, as, as Daryl Strawberry said in that in the Billy Joel documentary, yeah, it was a dump, but it was our dump. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All oh, right, well. so do we want to close on any note for uh, the year 2014? Well, how about a peek into what's gone on already in 15? I mean, it's only a week old, and we already got a new track. That's true. I'm just afraid that uh, that might the conversation could go on for an hour just talking about <laughs> you know on Kanye. Okay. So, uh, you know, so um, come back next week, Tom. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. We keep dragging them back. Yeah, Every like, time I think out. I'm out, they wrote me back in. <laughs> there we go. There we go. We should mention the um, the interview with uh, little Stephen Van Zant that's available online. That's oh, yeah. uh, really worth taking the time to. I think it's about an hour long. Where, well, the the interview itself is like forty minutes, I think Van Sant says, but it's a it's is a this, the show. Is this on the on the the site for the for Little Stevens Underground Garage? Yes, yes, right. it's show six sixty six. Okay, six sixty six. And uh, he's, he, yeah, I, we <laughs> won't go into that. We won't go into that. But it's the entire show and and without commercials. And uh, so, yeah, and it's a free even. So, yeah, it's worth hearing. And as we were talking before the show, uh, he talks about pinwheel twist. He talks about That's Beatles right. experimentation. He talks about there's a it, it really goes off off the usual uh, McCartney interview, and it's well worth hearing. Oh, cool. So, yeah, I was really surprised when he brought up pinwheel twist because uh, you know I, I was just saying to everybody uh, before the show here that I never even knew about that song until Mark Lewis and wrote about it in the Beatles live. And that was supposed to be a song that Pete best sang lead to. Although there's some dispute that maybe when Pete left the group that maybe Paul sang lead on it, but uh, it was a song that Paul wrote that Paul was certainly not praising. <laughs> right. But uh, just, just the fact that he even mentioned that, that he even brought that up was a bit of a shock. And, uh, you know, just talking about different techniques the Beatles used in the studio was really good. Paul yes. really opening up this interview. Yeah, and Van Zant was using his experience as a music, musician, talking about, you know, to, to get Paul to talk about stuff. And that was really, that's really unusual, you know, in, in McCartney interviews to have Paul open up like that. But I guess because, you know, you had Van Zant doing it, uh, McCartney got real comfortable. And it's great, and it really sounds good. So i I, I got to re- recommend that. Um, mm-hmm. All right. So before we go here, um, if any of you would like to get in touch with us, you can write to us at our email address, which is things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. We also have our own Facebook page for things we said today. Steve has several Facebook pages, one under his own name, Steve Marinucci, also for Beatles, Beatles news and commentary. And um, if you want to get in touch with me, you can write to me at my email address, which is everylittlething at att.net. And if you can, please check out my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. There's not only Beatles trivia every single week where you can win great prizes, but there's a lot of interviews with people in the Beatle world that you can find on there. And there's special contests that I run once in a while. In fact, there's a brand new one for everyone listening to this show where you can win your choice of one of two 1964 art prints done by a great Beatles artist, Shannon. And so uh, if you can, please check out the website. It's KenMichaelsRadio.com. You'll find out all the details on there. Mm. Okay. So with that, this is uh, Ken Michaels for Things We Said Today. For Steve Marinucci, Al Sussman, Alan Cozen, and our special guest, Tom Franjone. 
Will he be back next week? Ah, only the shadow knows. (laughs) (laughs) Tune in and you'll find out. And thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.